Herzlich willkommen. Was ein gutes, erfülltes Leben ausmacht? Einfach. Frei denken, furchtlos forschen und dann handelnd hoffen. Mit anderen Worten als überzeugte Humanistin durchs Leben gehen, sagt mein heutiger Gast, die englische Philosophin und Schriftstellerin Sarah Bakewell. Aber ist das wirklich so einfach? Und wirklich alles? Ja, Frau Bakewell, jetzt habe ich Sie unseren Zusehern als Schriftstellerin, als Philosophin vorgestellt. Irgendetwas Wesentliches vergessen? Well, I probably am a, a lot of things, um, but recently I've added one to the list. I've become a keen bird watcher, which is uh, quite interesting because it's, of course, fun to do, but it's completely outside the realm of ideas and the mind. It really is about attention and trying to learn the details of what you're looking at. Um, I find it an absolute joy. But I must say, a lot of people think, oh, birds must be a lovely break from the problems of the world because they're so, um, they're sweet. They sit in a bush and they sing. And in fact, the more I look at them, the more I realize that the world of the bird is a world of aggression, <laughs> violence, competition. They're always having a go at each other and uh, trying to establish territory. And it's, it's, Very much like the world of humans, actually. Man sieht die Welt durch die Vögel noch mal ganz neu und offenbar auch nicht ganz friedlich. Ich hätte ja auch sagen können, Sie sind Universitätsdozentin, Bibliothekarin, Hundebesitzerin. Anders gesagt, ich hätte auch sagen können, Sie sind einfach ein Mensch. <lacht> well, I'm probably all of those things. I was a librarian for, for many years, working with early printed books at uh, the Wellcome Library in London, which is a library of the history of medicine. But it defines medicine really as anything to do with human beings and in fact other animals as well. So it's a pretty wide idea of what that is. Um, cats and dogs, I've had both. I uh, became a dog lover more as uh, once we got some dogs, hmm. which now I'm very, very uh, attached to. So. Aber ist es nicht seltsam, wenn man erst mal anfängt, über seine eigene Existenz nachzudenken und sich eine Liste macht, was man alles ist, dann wird diese Liste fast unendlich lang. Well, you know, maybe there's a humanist point there because it's the idea of attaching labels, especially if they're labels that are defined by excluding others and saying what you're not. So I am a dog person, therefore I hate cats, or I am a cat person, I hate dogs. Um, I think that is a very strong, especially when you're talking about the humanist attitude to religion. Religion can be a very positive thing, but it's it, this identifying as one and therefore the enemy is those who don't follow the same religion as you. That's something that humanists generally tend to be very much um, against. Das heißt, wenn man sich selbst identifiziert und sagt, ich bin das und das, dann besteht immer die Möglichkeit und auch die Gefahr, sich abzugrenzen. Während ich Sie richtig verstehe, die Humanisten, in deren Tradition Sie sich verstehen, die meinen das eher inklusiv. They do, I think. I think the best form of humanism does. There's a There's a paradox, of course, there, because as soon as you say, I'm a humanist, you kind of have accepted a label on yourself. Und And man it... grenzt sich schon ab von gewissen anderen. <laughs> Potentially, because as soon as there's a label, that is the risk. Um, I think that, that humanists try to use that labeling in a positive way. So I think to uh, raise awareness in the world of this is a valid way of looking at the world, this is an alternative perhaps to some religious views. I'm talking about modern humanism here, the kind that humanist organizations represent. Um, that it's a tradition, a very powerful tradition that has many forms and has gone in different directions and that tries not to be exclusive, in fact. But it is still something that is worth talking about. And you can't really talk about things unless you have words and words are kind of label. So it's a bit hard to avoid labeling anything at all. Wir werden jetzt noch hoffentlich genauer verstehen, wie diese Tradition aussieht, was es bedeutet, ein Humanist zu sein und was nicht. Wenn man den Titel Ihres neuesten Buches, das vom Humanismus handelt, nimmt, dann könnte man sagen, es ist eigentlich ein seltsamer Titel. Da steht nicht, wie man Mensch ist, sondern wie man Mensch wird. Das heißt, es ist eine Aufgabe. Kennen Sie denn eigentlich Menschen, die an dieser Aufgabe gescheitert sind, sozusagen auf halber Strecke liegen geblieben sind zur Menschwerdung? Uh 
very good question and I must say the title of the German edition is in fact different from the original title so this is a new one I'm, you know to talk about that um, it is uh, n I think actually no you can't you, otherwise you're, you're in danger of talking about something that's less than human or, or subhuman and that is very definitely a direction I think is is not to go in um, but what humanists have often said is that we can become a more enriched human, humanly more enriched by education, by cultural experiences, by contacts with other human beings, by learning from teachers and those that we grow up with and learning throughout life more about other people's experiences and about how um, humans have created culture through the years. So all of this is you could say it's becoming more human, but not that we ever fail to be human. Und doch gibt es da doch ein philosophisches Problem oder etwas zu beachten. Man kann ja zum Beispiel sagen von einer Blume. Sie ist aufgeblüht und ist ganz zur Blüte gelangt. Und in diesem Sinne können wir sagen, es gibt schon viele Menschen, von denen wir doch in der Straßenbahn, wenn wir in der Arbeitswelt sind, sagen, die sind irgendwie nicht ganz aufgegangen. Well... How, how, who am I to say that somebody else hasn't blossomed? Uh, they may well have blossomed in their own way. I very much, when I travel around on trains and tubes, you know, there's an interesting one. I remember when I was young, I used to look at a lot of the people on the, the trains and, and think, oh, they look so sad. They must have really failed lives and feel... Das ist der Blick des Schriftstellers immer. <laughs> no, that's the view of a of a young person because what I then realized as I grew a bit older is that actually you just develop lines and there's such a thing as gravity which drags your face down <laughs> and <laughs> you can be very happy and then you look in the mirror and you look really serious it's because of just the way that the face behaves you become more um, perhaps a, as if you're you, more mature is a good way of saying it but also life leaves its mark on each mm. of us purely physically and and so that was a funny i remember thinking oh yeah they weren't all sad they were just older than i was aber philosophisch ich will das mal in einer ersten näherung versuchen könnte man sagen der humanismus ist ein gewisser blick auf die menschliche existenz und dieser blick wünscht sich dass der mensch selbstbestimmt eine maximale ausschöpfung aller möglichen menschlichen potenziale unternimmt i think that's one way of looking at it i Something that humanists stress and are very interested in, though, is that this isn't done in isolation as an individual unconnected to those around you. Quite the opposite. Humanists are very interested in uh, society, how we relate to each other, how we live together in civic um, cities and, and other communities, um, and also in moral, uh, moral relationships to other human beings and in fact to other life on this planet um, so it's not a kind of um, isolated unit that uh, you are floating around in space as an individual I, I don't think wherever that way we all grow up with some form of, of network of other people around us and this is in fact what enables us to become a uh, more humanized you might say person because we are connected to other people right down at the roots of our being und das ist ja auch das motto das wie ein roter faden durch ihr buch geht das heißt just connect mm -hmm. verbinde dich das ist ein motto eines schriftstellers ihm forster das sie nehmen um diese eigenwillige und eigenständige definition des humanismus zu wagen sie sagen wir sind vernetzte verbindungswesen und wenn wir bei dieser organischen metapher bleiben kann man sagen wir blühen überhaupt nur auf wenn wir uns in diesem netz des lebens Finden und begreifen. Yeah, I have a, a couple of, fam of quite famous lines which, which accompanied me through all the writing of the book. One of them you mentioned, only connect, in a novel by E.M. Forster, mm -hmm. which means not only to connect to other people, but to connect, for, for example, to understand the consequences of your own actions and how they affect other people, and to kind of connect within yourself too, not to be a hypocrite who ignores the consequences or ignores half of what you're really doing because it's not convenient and uh, um, so connection um, in yourself and among other people another which is saying the same thing in a different way another favorite quote of of mine and of many humanists is um, 
I am human, I consider nothing human alien to me, which was said by the Roman poet Terence in um, the first century AD. Um, he actually used it, he was a comic playwright, so he used it in uh, one of his plays as a joke, really, because somebody had said uh, to a, 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 the person who said it had been accused of being a nosy neighbour, always looking over the fence at what his, the guy next door was doing. So too much of a busybody, uh, too nosy about people. And, uh, and he said, well, I'm human. Nothing human is alien to Was me. Erwarten Sie? It was a joke. What do you expect? You, know, um, you can imagine the audience would have just laughed and it was kind of meant as a laugh. But the, in, it actually makes a really good motto for what humanists believe, that we are all connected through our essential humanity in some way. And so they've used it ever since. Um, it's become a favorite motto. Es ist ja auch deswegen so schön, weil der Humanismus einen möglichst klaren Blick auf unsere Existenzweise wagt. Und das heißt nicht nur das Edle, das Schöne, das Erhabene zu betonen, sondern auch die kleine Neugier, vielleicht auch die kleine moralische Abwegigkeit. Das heißt, mm. und der muss man mit Humor, Nachsicht und ein bisschen Vergebung begeben, begegnen. Yes, I think that uh, there is a a kind of humanist style, ideally. Uh, it's not to say that all humanists have this. Uh, like, they're human beings. You get all sorts of uh, character traits among humanists. But I think there's a tendency to um, respect and be interested in the differences among humans, as well as believing that at the heart of it, there is something that binds us all together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually... Uh, the This is from a religious tradition, but the um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa uh, talked about a concept which is established in several Southern African societies of Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And um, it means the community connections, it means a sort of binding together of, of human beings and of all life. Mm -hmm. He talked about a bundle of life, that we belong in a bundle of life. Um, and he used this concept when he was chairing the Truth and Reconciliation um, commission in South Africa after the end of apartheid and he made it central to his vision of how to move forward from that, that we are all already connected. It's just we forget that and, and we need to re-establish that connection. Es gibt ja fast jede große Weisheitslehre, sei es östlich, sei es in Afrika, sei es in Europa, hat diese Idee der Verknüpfung und der Verwobenheit, der Relationalität des Daseins. Man kann ja sagen, der Humanismus, und das ist auch eine Weise, only connect zu verstehen, ist, wir müssen mit der Tradition eine neue Verbindung eingehen. Denn Humanisten sind nicht unbedingt Aufklärer, sie sind auch nicht gleich Philosophen, sondern es gibt eine europäische Tradition des Humanismus, die auch im Zentrum ihres Buches steht. Und die fängt so im 14. Jahrhundert an einem der schönsten Orte der Welt an, nämlich in Norditalien. Warum ausgerechnet dort? Yeah, I decided I had to start it somewhere. So apart from putting some of the context at the beginning of the book, I then went on to tell a story really that is mainly, mostly in Europe, not exclusively, but mostly. And that starts, I started in 13, around 1300. The reason for that is partly just particular people that I thought were important in the history of humanism and um, what they thought that they were achieving, what they wanted to achieve. So we're talking about uh, Francesco Petrarca, Petrarch in English, who um, was every, a bit of everything, really. He was a poet. Wir sehen ihn da kurz eingeblendet, ja. Good, yes, he's, uh, yep, he uh, is, um, you know, we only have a kind of vague sense of what he looked like, of course. Uh, portraits differ, but he um, knew everybody. He was at the center of a huge network of um, other literary people, also people within the church, people who wor worked in various uh, kind of princely courts um, or in ad administration, civic administration. He uh, did a lot of writing for various patrons within this. So he was a kind of bit of a humanist for hire, you could say. He would work for people who would support him and uh, so he would churn out poems for them and all kinds of genres. But what I really uh, find fascinating in him is that he himself saw himself as um, kind of creating the material for a new beginning, um, for a more civilized uh, way of living. And he saw the path to that as being going back to the classical 
writers, especially of um, Republican era Rome. Cicero was one of his great heroes. And the way in which they wrote about uh, life in general, but particularly about how to manage politics well. And, um, and he wrote about it, this light that could be taken from those people and um, sort of kindled back to life, this light, as opposed to what he saw as a long dark age between them. So when people talk about the dark ages, which they don't, historians have sort of, mm, it's not a cliche geworden, that's heute very much a cliche, ist. but we've actually got Petrarch to thank for that. Um, he, what it interested me was this idea of using literature and the wisdom of the past to create a new beginning and a sense of hope for him. Da haben Sie jetzt schon mal, glaube ich, drei ganz wichtige Charakteristika der humanistischen Ursprünge genannt. Das eine ist die Erneuerung der Kultur durch einen Rückgriff auf ältere Quellen. Dann haben Sie gesagt, es geht um einen Menschen, der durch Literatur und durch Schreiben sich selbst zu einem besseren, vollkommeneren Menschen machen will. Und das dritte, ganz interessant, es war ein Zentrum dieser Petraka von ganz verschiedenen Interessen. Man könnte das, und es gibt einen humanistischen Begriff dafür, auch als den Urmo Universalen nennen. Ein Mensch, der in der Politik, mhm. in der Kunst, im Sport, in allen Bereichen des alltäglichen Lebens nach Perfektion strebt. Yes, I mean, we, at least in English, it have taken at one point we'd talk about renaissance man uh, again a phrase that's gone a little out of fashion but that is the the idea of uh, i think what's really important in that idea is the sense that uh, knowledge learning curiosity about the world is for living in a more human way living in a better way um not just about a, a sort of a narrow specialism. It became talked about a lot in the 19th century when um, writers who were humanistically inclined began to see mm -hmm. this very specialized education um, and said, no, you know, education is about more than that. It's about becoming a good human being becoming um, a more cultured you know, human being. Aber waren dafür die Klöster nicht schon da? Die wollten noch gute Menschen, gelehrte Menschen erziehen. Was war denn der Widerstand, der Petrarca angestoßen hat? Well, it's, it's, he wasn't the only one who, you know, he wasn't anti the monasteries exactly, but he did think that um, they were cut off from the world and that this is a basic problem mhm. with... Um, communities cut off from the world. You could probably actually say a lot about uh, universities um, along the same lines, is that it's a sort of privileged community of scholars, which is good, but he wanted to, um, well, he lived in the world. I mean, he had to ist das dieser be involved in politics. Von dem man immer spricht, der hat einen Elfenbeinvorwurf und sagt, wir yeah. müssen, um die Welt zu verstehen, müssen wir in der Welt handeln und uns einlassen auf sie. That would, that became even more than Petrarch, in the following century, by the 15th century, they became very engaged in the world, very concerned with um, taking responsibility for your uh, political context, for being active, making a better city or a better co country or community, mm -hmm. um, putting all that uh, knowledge and study to use in some way. Um, so. Not all of them, but, but a lot of them did get involved in government at a local level and uh, were Sie, active. Sie sind ja als Schriftstellerin und Philosophin auch jemand, der die eigene Zeit beobachtet und vielleicht denkt, was kann ich der eigenen Zeit aus der Geschichte der Philosophie beibringen? Was kann ich ihr zeigen? Und da gibt es für mich ein bisschen eine Fraglichkeit. Man könnte sagen, noch nie waren die Menschen so verbunden wie jetzt. Noch nie waren sie da so aufgefordert, ein Individuum zu werden wie jetzt. Man könnte auch sagen, noch nie waren sie so weltlich wie jetzt. Und das ist auch für viele ein Problem. Viele sind zu vernetzt. Viele sind in zu vielen Projekten ähm, verfangen. Was ist denn die Therapie, die der Humanismus unserer Kultur heute vor allem vorschlagen kann? That's a very good point. And as I was writing the book and, and returning to the idea of only connect, I occasionally thought, well, maybe we need less connection. Es könnte ein Smartphone-Slogan sein, yeah. just I connect mean, or only certainly connect. Certainly, I yeah. had to put down my smartphone or I would never have got the book written. And, uh, you know, also, of course, just the free sharing of information, of, of knowledge. Well, that was a very good thing for a very long time. But now we're starting to ask, what, what quality of information are we talking about? Are we talking about 
fake news, which spreads very quickly around the place, but is not necessarily a very useful thing. Um, yeah, I think what a humanist would say would be that it's about the quality of also of the connection and the quality of the knowledge and the sharing of information. So um, somebody like Petrarch was writing in the context where the big challenge was how do you disseminate this knowledge? How do you make connection with people? So when he found, uh, he often travelled around monasteries looking to see what they had in their mm -hmm. collections of manuscripts. Like and Schatzjäger. Yeah. Absolutely, um, which I can relate to because I, I do a lot of that going around second-hand bookshops, but uh, I never find the things he found, which were <laughs> incredibly precious. Um, copies sometimes unique of, of classical texts. But he would um, then, if he wanted to do anything with that, he would either have to sit down and copy it out by hand um, or borrow it or... And there are stories of him travelling around with his friends and uh, then he'd say to them, sorry, I've just found this manuscript, so we need to stay here for three days while I sit <laughs> and copy it out by hand. Right, keine copy-paste-Funktion, nehme ich yeah, an. Das that man alles per hand wasn't machen. working, yeah. It's, uh, so for him and his contemporaries, it, it was a good and exciting idea that you would be able to um, disseminate information as widely as possible because... They couldn't. Um, for us, we have the opposite problem, perhaps. We have a, a lot of information. The question is, how do we select among it? How do we use that information? How do we sort out the mm -hmm. reliable from the non-reliable? Um, you know, I, I think that what a humanist would contribute to that would be mainly about reminding us of the importance of looking at who wrote it. Is it... For real? Is it fake? Is Und das it? sind ja Kompetenzen, die auch heute in den Humanities, die so genannt werden, auch gelehrt werden. Wie können wir überhaupt den falschen und von dem echten Text unterscheiden, die Quellen einordnen? Sehr wichtig. Es gibt aber noch ein anderes Moment, das mir auffiel in diesem wunderbaren Buch, fast auch ein Pattern, ein Muster. Alle diese Humanistinnen, meistens sind es aber Männer, sind Rebellen. Sie rebellieren gegen ihre Eltern, sie rebellieren gegen die etablierte Kultur. Und sie rebellieren in Form der Literatur, und der Poesie. Da würde ich mich jetzt fragen, wie war das denn eigentlich bei Ihnen biografisch? Waren Sie auch von einem solchen <lacht> Rebellendrang getragen und war für Sie auch die Literatur eine Form der Rebellion? Well, I had a hard time compared to Petrarch and, and the rest because I have parents who love books, love reading, are very open-minded. <lacht> Um, it was very hard to find anything I could rebel about, uh, but I did my best. I, I tried to find something, anything that, that they would disapprove of when I was a teenager and, you know, managed a few things. But, uh, no, I, I have tended to go my own way sometimes. Uh, this is why I, although I, I studied philosophy at university, but I didn't continue into an academic career, and that was for... Uh, really mainly I wanted to be a writer. I thought I wanted to write fiction. I wanted a different direction. But I think a lot of it now looking back was also about the uh, independence of, of thought, perhaps that I felt I would have, independence of choices. Um, I'm partly reading back a something that sounds good into me, you know, actually mm. just being a bit... Uh, Off the rails. <lacht> Aber wenn man sich mit ihrer Biografie auch als Schriftstellerin beschäftigt, dann kriegt man schon einen gewissen Verdacht, dass es da einen Autor gab, der eine Art Initialzündung für sie war, nämlich Jean-Paul Sartre, der ein Modell geliefert dafür hat, wie man in heutiger Zeit solch ein unabhängiges Leben führt. Und wir schauen uns mal einen kleinen Film an, der uns erklärt, was Sartre auch mit den Humanisten verbindet. Der französische Philosoph Jean-Paul Sartre ist einer der wichtigsten Vertreter des Existenzialismus. Sartres Denken kreist um die Frage, was es heißt, authentisch zu leben. Also frei von äußeren oder inneren Zwängen. Ganz und gar selbstbestimmt. Bis heute der Traum fast aller moderner Menschen. Der Kampf um Freiheit hat bei Sartre auch biografische Wurzeln. Er war Soldat im Zweiten Weltkrieg und geriet als junger Mann in deutsche Gefangenschaft. Nach dem Krieg blieb er politisch äußerst aktiv und engagierte sich für die Arbeiterbewegung, die Emanzipation und gegen den Kolonialismus. 
Sein bekanntester Satz lautet, der Mensch ist zur Freiheit verurteilt. Nach Sartre kann sich jeder Mensch in jeder Lebenssituation für oder gegen eine Handlung entscheiden. Jeder Mensch ist somit für seine Taten, sein eigenes Leben und das seiner Mitmenschen voll verantwortlich. Radikaler Individualismus und politische Solidarität sind für Sartre also miteinander vereinbar. Heute würde sich Sartre vielleicht zu Instagram, TikTok und Co. äußern und bemängeln, dass wir in der scheinbar authentischen Selbstdarstellung selbst zu einer Ware verkommen. Sicher würde er sich auch fragen, wie die eigene Freiheit in Zeiten der Klimakrise mit der Freiheit aller anderen vereinbar ist. Worauf muss ich verzichten, damit andere selbstbestimmt leben können? Übrigens gestaltete Sartre auch sein Liebesleben eher frei. Er führte, damals skandalös, ab 1929 eine offene Beziehung mit der Philosophin Simone de Beauvoir. Mehr als ein halbes Jahrhundert lebten und dachten die beiden gemeinsam und blieben einander auf ihre Weise treu. Simone de Beauvoir und Jean-Paul Sartre gelten daher in polyamorösen Kreisen als Vorreiter. Wie viele Existenzialisten verfasste Sartre seine Gedanken auch in Form von Romanen und Theaterstücken. Er schrieb geradezu manisch, oft mehrere Dutzend Seiten täglich. Aufputschmittel begleiteten seinen Alltag. In den 1930er Jahren experimentierte er auch mit Meskalin. Mit dem Ergebnis, dass er sich monatelang von menschengroßen Krustentieren verfolgt fühlte. Sartre war im Nachkriegsfrankreich ein führender Intellektueller. Der erste Popstar der Philosophie. Als er 1980 starb, erwiesen ihm am Pariser Friedhof Montparnasse 50.000 Menschen die letzte Ehre. Er hatte sein Leben so gelebt, wie er es wollte. Ja, Frau Beckwell, über das Leben von Sartre und seinen Mitdenkerinnen haben Sie auch ein eigenes Buch geschrieben, Das Café der Existenzialisten, ein weltweiter Erfolg. Und man kann in der Energie dieses Buches spüren, dass diese Existenzialisten auch als Humanisten für Sie eine Art Rollenmodell wurden, eine Befreiung der eigenen Art. Well, there's a few things about that. One is to say, I was completely blown away by, by Sartre when I was about uh, um, 16. But it actually wasn't the uh, philosophical or the humanist or the political stuff. Um, it was his novel, Nausea, La Nausée, which um, really describes uh, the main character just sort of drifts around in this uh, seaside town and um, spends a lot of time thinking about being, you know, why is anything there rather than nothing? Mm -hmm. um, he would go to parks and look at trees and, and think, they're so full of being they're, they're overwhelming me and so I would you know, I went to my local park and looked at a tree and tried to have the same experience so I think what I took out of that which has really stayed with me is the sense of a kind of fascination with the physical world and the human world that's you about that it's that astonishment which Heidegger was also the starting point for him is a kind of radical amazement at the fact that we are here and the world is here not looking for some explanation for it in religious ways. I've never really been inclined to do that, but I think that um, like wow factor of the, the, the sheer you know, being here and being able to see the world is something that uh, has always stayed with me. And it really sparked, funnily enough, my interest in philosophy. Um, but in terms of the rebel quality of existentialists, yes, that certainly, I think a lot of people at that kind of age, you're looking for something, a philosophy that will speak to you directly, which that certainly does, because it's about how you live as a human being. Um, I also became very interested by Simone de Beauvoir, who mm. was much more, of course, than just a companion to Sartre. I mean, she was a... Uh, very important feminist writing the second sex she also wrote works of philosophy which are very interesting and she wrote um, novels of, and a fantastic autobiography full of just the again the detail of everyday life which really fascinated me wenn man diese beiden bücher zusammen sieht dann fällt einem auf ein begriff haben sie gemeinsam nämlich freiheit 
Und der Humanismus ist natürlich auch eine Philosophie der Freiheit und der Selbstbestimmung. Es ist eine Philosophie der Emanzipation gegen die Kirche, gegen äußere Zwänge und eine Philosophie der Selbstwerdung. Das sind doch vielleicht drei Dinge, von denen man sagen kann, das haben die Humanisten und die Existenzialisten eigentlich gemeinsam. Es gibt ja auch einen berühmten Aufsatz von Sartre, der sagt, der Existenzialismus ist ein Humanismus. Dieses Freiheitsbedürfnis, das scheint doch die Quelle zu sein. Yes, uh, very much so, although I think both humanists and existentialists do emphasize that it's not a fr complete freedom to do as you please. It's a freedom that's several things. It brings a, a moral dimension. It's very important that there is a moral dimension. There might not be any easy answers or instructions about how to behave, but ethical behavior is very important. Um, the other thing is that... Um, they, it's a freedom that's in situation. This is how Sartre wrote about it, that it's... Also keine unbedingte free. Freiheit. Keine unbedingte Freiheit. It's a freedom where we always start out from some situation in life. We're, again, not floating around in a void. So it's a freedom in how you respond to that situation. And that situation could be very challenging, very limiting. Um, but you still have... It's a kind of old stoic idea, actually, that you still have the freedom of how you respond to that how you experience it, how you live it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's a kind of freedom, I think, that we can relate to, because if you talk about freedom as if it was just like, well, hey, you know, I can do anything, um, that's a, philosophically and in real life is a problematic idea. The more we understand about ourselves scientifically, neurologically and everything else, the more we anyway realise that... Um, there's not some consciousness sitting up in control as a ghost in the machine directing you what to do. We are physical beings that are influenced by our physical... Verbunden, thing, wiederum. ...and connected to the physical world around us. So it's a freedom... I think I, existentialist freedom and humanist freedom are interesting because they emphasise the freedom, but in the context of all these things that kind of enmesh us everywhere and link us to the world. Es gibt vielleicht noch einen weiteren Punkt, den diese beiden Traditionen, die Ihnen so wichtig sind, gemeinsam haben. Und das ist eine gewisse Aversion gegen die Religion als den gesellschaftlichen Faktor, der Zwänge gesellschaftlicher, theologischer, auch nicht ganz rationaler Art auf eine Gesellschaft hinauffropft. Man kann sich immer fragen, gegen wen agieren die Humanisten eigentlich? Und vielleicht kann man sagen, zunächst einmal gegen religiöse Dogmen. Well, yes, of course, a lot of humanists and some existentialists were also religious, very much believers, and felt deeply about religion. I mean, somebody like Erasmus in the history of humanism, profoundly um, religious mm -hmm. and dedicated to working on texts of the Bible to make it better and purer and more like the original you know, intention. Auch um ihn von the, Dogmen zu befreien, allerdings. Yes, because I think that what um, they don't like is the authoritarian component that some religious institutions have. So when church or other institutions dictate how people should behave or dress, or it is the dogma part that is problematic for many humanists, including some very religious humanists today. I mean, it is, I think, for me, it is perfectly compatible. Um, it doesn't have to be a non-religious humanism, but it does have to be a humanism. For me, the elements that make it humanistic are if the main interest is on our lives and um, behaviour and ethics here on earth in everyday life, or, you know, in physical life, not in the afterlife. Um, that's one component. I think it has to be a sort of earth eine diesseitige Haltung, nicht das Jenseits, das wichtig ist, das Diesseits. Yeah, so you might still believe in another world, but if the emphasis is on how you live in this world, then that's a strong, potentially a humanist component, I think. Um, and not authoritarian. I think this, that's what is a problem for humanists. And that can not only be in religion, but also in politics, which of course is something that we're seeing very alarmingly mm. today as the rise of authoritarian state-based systems. 
Vielleicht will ich doch nochmal auf das Verhältnis von Religion und Theologie und Humanismus eingehen. Es gibt eine Kampagne der englischen Humanisten, die auch eine einige Vereinigung haben. Und die gab es auch auf Londoner Bussen. Und wir schauen uns mal kurz an, was da stand. Da stand nämlich, there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Es gibt wahrscheinlich keinen Gott. Hör auf, dir Sorgen zu machen. Genieß dein Leben. Ich finde das eine sehr interessante Kampagne. Sie hat einen großen Skandal ausgelöst äh, in Großbritannien. Aber das am Ende, was kommt, genieß einfach dein Leben. Da könnte man sagen, es gibt noch einen weiteren Aspekt, den Hedonismus. Mach dir keine Sorgen, versuch im Diesseits so viel Spaß zu haben, wie du kannst. Und das ist dann nicht Humanismus, das ist doch eigentlich schon so eine Art neoliberaler Imperativ. Uh, no, and that's another, the distinction between neoliberalism and even liberalism, I think, is another um, thing that we can talk about. With that campaign, which I, I really like, to me the important words there are don't worry. So, and the implication of that, I think, is, um, you know, this goes back to very ancient authors, Democritus and Protagoras, um, wrote about the gods saying, you know, they may or may not exist, but... Um, It's a shame to waste your life worrying about that, fearing them. Um, and that's been a tradition, I think, through humanism, is whether they exist or not. Uh, and I'm not talking about making moral decisions. I'm talking about um, sort of just losing the ability to appreciate this world because of a feeling that some religions do encourage of that you should... Deny this world. You should remove yourself from this world Und into a remote community. Dazu. And yes, that you should deny the the body. You should, um, you know, live a, a self-abnegating life in 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 terms of as a human being. I mean, really, a lot of what human beings do should be. No, you should only think of the afterworld you should all your thoughts should be on on god and your future expectations of heaven uh, this is a long theological tradition in christianity a kind of minority one because most people don't do that but but you do get quite a lot of um, religious texts which which write in those und in der philosophie kann man sagen der platonismus ist auch so eine Haltung, dass man sagt, der Körper ist nicht so wichtig und es gibt ein Jenseits, dass das eigentlich Wirkliche und Wahre ist. Und die Humanisten sagen, bleiben wir mal auf dieser Welt. Yes, and, and let's live a good life here. I think that's the key thing with, with humanists. Another one of my favorite quotations, which I use in the book several times and sort of end with, is from a 19th century um, freethinker, non-religious freethinker free called uh, Robert Ingersoll. And he came up with what he called his happiness creed. And the lines of that were, um, happiness is the only good. The time to be happy is now. The place to be happy is here. And the all-important final line is, the way to be happy is to make others so. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's all about connection. And it's not about pursuing your own happiness at the expense of others, which comes back to the neoliberalism idea there's something deeply anti-humanist about that because what that forgets is this connection and the fact that we are all parts of each other das we're all auch, bound up with each other das ist auch so interessant an ihrem buch und auch an ihrer weise den humanismus zu lesen weil es wird als eine individualistische vielleicht sogar als eine private haltung oft zum ausdruck gebracht und sie wollen ihn solidarisieren ich möchte nicht sagen sozialisieren aber sie sagen das funktioniert alles nur wenn wir uns als relationale Menschen denken. Und das ist innerhalb des Humanismus nicht immer so gewesen. Selbst bei Sartre kann man sagen, gibt es diese Spannung zwischen der Selbstwerdung und den anderen. Und so leicht zu lösen ist sie ja nicht. Ja, und ich denke, dass insofern als Sartre war was, was humanist, he, he wasn't, you know, in fact, he wrote a great deal about the other. His philosophical books are filled with thoughts on our relationships with other people. Um, towards the It's always difficult with Sartre because he changed his ideas so much during his career. So when we talk about Sartre as a humanist, that tends to be the kind of early mm -hmm. Sartre. He then um, came very much under the sway of Marxism and he tried to be a good Marxist. Wieder eine dogmatische Lehre, kann man sagen. Well, yes. And in fact, the Marxists didn't like him because they were so... <laughs> you're, but you're a, you know, your existentialist philosophy doesn't fit with our ideology. But he was sort of, no, please, can I be a Marxist? I want to be a Marxist. Um, 
It, they're fundamentally incompatible, actually, because existentialism does stress individual responsibility um, and, and choices. Das ist ja auch die Spannung, in der der Humanismus freedom. steht, nicht wahr? Die, die yeah. Spannung geht ja nicht mm. weg. Ähm, und ich glaube, in, in dem Moment, in dem man den Humanismus zu sehr solidarisiert und sozialisiert, kriegt man etwas, verliert man etwas von dem Feuer, das die Selbstwertung ermöglicht. I think the, the biggest the problem is not so much in connection with, with others, though. In Marxism, the big problem is um, the ideology. And it's the fact, the biggest sticking point, I think, for anybody who believes in freedom or individual um, responsibility is that for Marxism, there is a absolutely inevitable unfolding of history. And it's going to happen, whatever you do. Ein Pilot in der Geschichte. Yeah, yeah. So... And no existentialist can, can really reconcile themselves with that. Um, and it's very problematic for humanists, because where does the individual fit into that? Um, das war auch die Frage von Simone de Beauvoir. Natürlich, wie passe ich dann da noch rein mit meiner eigenen Handlungsweise? Yeah. Sie sagte etwas ganz Interessantes. Es geht immer auch gegen Ideologien. Und wir sprachen davon, warum jetzt den Humanismus wieder stark bringen. Ich glaube, wir vergessen in unserer kleinen Blase in Mittel- und Westeuropa, wie stark ideologisch und autoritär geprägt der Rest der Welt ist. Auch von religiösen Dogmen. Wenn wir zum Beispiel an den Iran denken, da gibt es diesen Slogan, ja. Frau, Leben, Freiheit. Und man kann sagen, das ist ja genau der humanistische Impetus. Wir wollen unseren Leib entfalten, wir wollen als leibliche Wesen frei sein, wir wollen als Frauen anerkannt werden, auch als Menschen, und wir wollen es für die Freiheit. Man könnte fast sagen, diese Befreiungsbewegung, die wir heute ein bisschen vergessen haben, nach einigen Monaten schon, ist auch eine humanistische Bewegung. Well, I wouldn't presume to speak for the Iranian people who've been doing that very bravely, um, because, you know, my guess is that some might uh, reconcile, recognize themselves in, in aspects of humanism and some might not, and I certainly don't want to impose a, a humanist framework on on another movement at all. So, uh, really, I think that's very, you know, that's very much not for me to say. Um, it does make me think of, of other humanist um, political attitudes to, to repression of any sort. Um, it, it brings to mind, actually, the um, 18th century feminist Mary Wollstonecraft, who I do um, find fascinating and I wrote about her in the book as a humanist as well as a feminist not that she used the word of herself but um, she saw the liberation of women as being absolutely um, part of general human flourishing um, what's holding women back the repression and the the great machinery that keeps them as in her world as sort of lifelong infants um, particularly the more privileged ones, because they were more, even more controlled on how they should behave. They had no rights. They couldn't uh, own property. Um, they couldn't make their own legal. They couldn't connect. That's right. And they were sort of kept. She compared them to birds in cages, you know, in sort of gilded cages. Um, she said that women have a right to a good education, because this was the biggest thing that was holding them back, not having the full range of education available to them if they wanted it, if they had an aptitude for it. And um, the um, not being able to be moral agents, this is the term that she used, that women should be able to be moral agents and make their own decisions, engage responsibly with the world as adults when they come of age. Um, this is a strong humanist message, I think, is, is that everybody should be um, able to do that. If they're, if they're able to do it, the path should be open for them to do it. And uh, so, yeah, I see, I see a strong humanist um, tradition that's there within the history of liberation movements of all kinds, not just feminism, but in, many others. In diesem Sinne kann man ja sagen, dass gewisse Kulturen auch die westliche Kultur, die Kultur, aus der der Humanismus entsprungen ist, doch gewisse Fortschritte gemacht haben, dass man da ein Stück weit auf diesem Weg nach vorne gegangen ist. Es gibt jetzt aber, und ich glaube, wir können nicht über Humanismus sprechen, ohne dieses Thema auszulassen äh, oder ohne dieses Thema vielmehr zu betonen, einen neuen Sprung, nämlich die Frage nach dem Transhumanismus. Man kann sagen, Humanisten können auf die Frage, was der Mensch ist, keine eindeutige Antwort geben. Und mittlerweile sind die Möglichkeiten des Menschen sich selbst zu überwinden, so fantastisch und so groß geworden, 
dass sie vielleicht sogar Humanisten Angst machen, oder? Um, I think like everybody else, we have to engage with those developments. I mean, the world is facing, when we say transhumanism, that? that's a um, particularly exaggerated and strong version of the, the general question about the future of humanity, given our technological um, connections, in fact, are uh, only connect, but we're connected not only through our technology, but to our technology. Um, it's influencing us, it's making a big difference to our everyday lives and the arrival of what we're tending to call AI um, at the moment, artificial intelligence, which I think isn't really that slightly missing the point to call it that because what's having an immediate impact on us is the ability of systems to imitate human language and human means of communication. Increasingly they're doing it so well that it's hard to tell if something's been written by a machine or by a human being. Yeah. That's a big problem in the humanities. It's a big problem in humanities teaching. You know, if you can't, really can't be sure Natürlich. whether Aber this ist, was a machine. Is there any consciousness behind it? Es ist doch ein Riesenproblem für Petrarca, Boccaccio und Montaigne, die glauben, dass man durch Text überhaupt erst zum Mensch wird, dass man schreibend zu dem wird, der man ist. Jetzt haben wir diese Maschinen, die können das alle, aber wir glauben nicht, dass die irgendetwas werden wollen oder werden können. No, and they have become what they are through text, because that's exactly what they, they do. They feed in text. huge quantities of human text, and so that they can predict what word is likely to follow another word. Um, it's a kind of horrible parody of, of human, the kind of humanist learning that Petrarch was, was dreaming would, uh, would solve the world's, you know, I mean... <laughs> It's, it, we don't know where, it's all so new. It's, there's so many problems that we're going to have to solve in really quite a practical way to do with teaching and how we kind of have to train ourselves to recognize um, what is of human origin, what is not. And what transhumanists would begin to say is, well, where's the boundary between those two things anyway? Because we, we use technology to write, we they foresee a future where those things really almost merge. Und religiöse Menschen würden sagen, ohne Religion ist diese Grenze dann gar nicht so klar und so fest zu ziehen. Sie wird sich immer weiter bewegen und da haben die vielleicht ein bisschen Angst. Was ich mir überlegt habe, indem ich ihr wunderbares Buch gelesen habe, was würde denn Petrarca denken, wenn man ihm heute zeigen würde, wie weit sein Traum von der Forschung, von der Literarisierung, von den Möglichkeiten der Wissenschaft gediehen ist. Würde er zum Beispiel bei Chatbot sagen, das ist fantastisch, davon habe ich immer geträumt, die maximale Konnektivität, die super Verbindungsmaschine. I think he would love it at first and then doubts might begin to creep in. Uh, he would be very concerned about the moral and political consequences because he was very concerned about those kinds of things. So I think he would have a big bonanza of getting onto Snapchat and, and TikTok and all of that. And, and then perhaps uh, he, he might have concerns about the human heart of all of this, the concerns about what it meant for human well-being. I do think he would do that. But only after he'd had a really good time surfing all this stuff. Wenn man dieses Motto, verbinde dich nur, just connect, auf Technologie bezieht, dann könnte man sagen, ja, dann lass dir doch eine Linse einbauen, in der du zehnmal besser siehst. Lass dir vielleicht irgendetwas einbauen, eine Device, die es noch nicht gibt, ein Mittel, das es noch nicht gibt, dass du zehn Sprachen leichter lernst. Was würde denn ein, eine humanistische Gegenposition sagen und sagen, nein, das machen wir nicht, das ist nicht gut für den Menschen, weil eigentlich müsste man doch sagen, Mach weiter, verbinde dich, wachse, schöpfe dein Potenzial aus. Um, that's, that's the device that uh, was called the Babel, Babel fish, the Babel fish in uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. I don't know how, whether that's just a... Unterwegs durch die Galaxis heißt <lacht> das Buch. Das ist eine fantastische <lacht> Sache. Ich hätte das gerne, muss ich zugeben. A wonderful comic imagining of a, of a future world and, uh, and including a, a, a kind of device that's rather like Wikipedia, mm. um, written in the 70s or early 70s anyway. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, that would be immediately appealing and, and, and useful in some ways. I mean, I'm not sure that there'd be any reason for a humanist not to 
not to like that particular bit of technology because it would restore us slightly to the benefits that used to come from Latin being a universal language. The problem with Latin was that it was only a small minority of people who had the privilege to learn it. Um, so it was exclusive, whereas this wouldn't be. It does make me think of another character who crops up in the book, who I wasn't expecting to write about, and then I realised how relevant he was, uh, Ludwig Zamenhof, who was the inventor of Esperanto. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he dreamed of. So he grew up in a very complex, in Biawistock, which is, was... Constantly moving Esperanto between ist der countries. Traum einer Sprache, die alle Sprachen so zusammenbringt, dass sie jeder yeah. am leichtesten lernen kann. Every, he, he thought that it would reduce the amount of conflict if people had, and the crucial thing was to have a, a language that everybody could learn very easily, so it had to be easy, and it didn't belong to any one group of people, so there was no territorial um, mm -hmm. supremacy of anybody. Um, you know, it was absolutely neutral, absolutely shared, just a human means of communicating which would help people to understand each other better. He also hoped to invent a uh, religion that which he called humanism, homoranismo, um, which would do the same sort of thing. It would be like a, a shared religion that we could all relate to as a kind of second religion, like we have a second language. Uh, fascinating ideas. I mean, it didn't quite come about. He thought it would might bring about world peace. That yeah. didn't quite happen. But um, I think it's really interesting that he tried. I think talking about the possibility, it focuses our attention on the importance of communication and even more so on the importance of, um, you know, recognizing what we do share over and beyond our divisions and our allegiances to nations and states and religions. Das ist ja ein ganz heikles Spiel und das ist wirklich ein grundphilosophischer Konflikt, die Differenz zu feiern, die wir sehen in der Pluralität die Menschen, der Menschen und trotzdem immer wieder auf das Gemeinsame hin zu gravitieren. Und das könnte man sagen, ist auch die Spannung, in der der Humanismus insbesondere steht. Hm. Yeah, I think at its best, humanism offers a way to, to do both. And certainly the recent humanist manifestos that have been produced by um, Humanist International the organization, um, they've worked hard to, to produce a statement of, of modern humanism which focuses very strongly both on the shared humanity, the shared quality that unites us all, and the um, respect for diversity, enormous cultural diversity, diversity of experiences, um, and also respect for the rest of the, national, the natural world because another strand in humanism that um, has been used as a criticism of it is that it foregrounds humans too much and is this at the expense of other species. Yeah. Again, modern humanists stress that it definitely doesn't shove other species out of the picture. Ja, das kann man immer betonen, aber man muss doch auch die Spannung wahrnehmen. Man kann sagen, nein, wir meinen das nicht so, aber es gibt eine Grenze. Man kann nicht alle inkludieren, ohne die eigenen Markenkern zu gefährden. Your own brand is, <laughs> um, yeah. Do humans have a brand? If so, I'm not sure it's doing very well on the. Ich denke, uh, <laughs> sie entwickeln den Brand des Humanismus. Sie versuchen das als eine kontinuierliche oh, Geschichte zu sehen. Ja. Yeah. Yes, and of course, humanism it does have that problem. Is that the more you look at it, the more you see what it can mean, um, the more you end up with uh, a a like this big octopus sort of image that can spread into almost any part of life. What tends to bring me back down to a solution to that and to keeping it in perspective, not letting it start to mean just everything, is a focus on what anti-humanism might mm. be. And anti-humanism, I think, is strongly identified either with these authoritarian state systems, anything that puts the state or the authority of an institution above the individual. Um, it was a very strong, for example, in the rise of fascism in Italy, the manifesto that was produced by uh, well, Mussolini and, um, and his uh, Giovanni Gentile, his sort of philosophical mm. sidekick was um, said, uh, it said two interesting things actually, that um, the individual is, is of, is of no consequence. The state is the state is what matters, and it also compared this to a religion. It's, this is a religious 
frame of mind that we're looking for. So a lot of authoritarian systems have that at the heart of it, that there is something that is, and it's usually an abstraction because it's either a, the, a religion or a state or an ideology such as Marxism. Um, I think when you get that, you see the strong anti-humanist um, tendency to, to have a giant authoritarian blob sort of hanging over us, which says, thou shalt do this, thou shalt mm. not do that. Und dann würde man sagen, der Humanismus ist vor allem eine Reaktion auf Macht und Wissensanmaßung von anderen. The, the way I sometimes think of it is that if you removed all of those authoritarian ideas, whether religious or non-religious, humanism is kind of what's left behind. It's, it's if you took away the um, uh, abuse of other people's rights, the imposition of um, com sort of commandments on other people that are not, you know, allowing them to live as fully as they could. Um, all of that, you sort of, what is humanism? It sort of puts it into, um, into focus in the picture because you've got a kind of outline of this is where anti-humanism begins. And so it sort of delineates the shape of what mm. humanism might be. And I do stress that I, this is not really about religion because I think that um, you get humanist and anti-humanist strands both within the religions and within atheism because after all, a lot of, a and of authoritarian states have been officially non-religious. So particularly the communist ones, uh, Stalinist Russia and so on. Und man kann doch sicher auch sagen, dass die Idee, dass Bildung, dass die schönen Künste und insbesondere die Sprachen eine besonders wichtige Rolle in unserer Existenz spielen, wenn es darum geht, ein gelingendes Leben sich selbst zu erschreiben, wie Sie es ja auch tun in Ihrer Existenz. Well, I mean, it's, I love literature, I love mm -hmm. reading art, all these things that I think are um, interesting and beautiful in themselves, but also because they, they come from a human consciousness. It brings us back to AI again. What if they were being generated yes. by a machine? Would I still find sein. them beautiful? Yeah. Um, but um, not only that, they're not just beautiful, I think there are ways to understand ourselves. That we understand each of our individual lives much more richly by going through what other people have written about their lives mhm. or by novels which capture a whole range of different kinds of lives of different people. Und das sind ja auch die Bücher, die sie schreiben. Es sind Bücher, die es uns ermöglichen, mit anderen Bewusstsein in Kontakt zu treten, manche nah an unserer Gegenwart, manche sehr weit. Und diese Form, die Verbindung zu schaffen, das ist eine Form zu Mensch zu werden. Und ich danke Ihnen sehr, dass Sie sie uns heute vorgeführt haben. Danke, dass Sie da waren, Frau Beckwell. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Was macht ein Leben zu einem wirklich menschlichen und vor allem zu einem gelungenen Leben? Antworten gerne in die Kommentarspalte. Zum Weiterschauen gibt es hier ein weiteres Gespräch mit dem Humanisten und Kognitionspsychologen Steven Pinker. Seine These, alles wird durch Wissenschaft ständig besser. Kann man auch mal drüber nachdenken.